Turn in your Bibles this morning uh, to Matthew chapter 13. Um, we're going to continue our Learning to Grow series on the parables of Jesus Christ. Today's message comes out of Matthew's gospel. It's on the wheat and the tares. And as I was studying this, it, it just kind of reminded me that the wheat and the tares, is, it's about end times. It's about, i got some bass going on here, Paul. It's about um, end times. Okay. The wheat and the tares is a lot to do with the good and the bad that's in your life, the right and the wrong. So this morning, that's what we're going to be talking about. So I'm going to read, if, when you get there, t- follow me with me as we turn. Another parable he put forth to them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. But when the grain had sprouted and produced a crop. Then the tares also appeared. So the servants of the owner came and said to him, Sir, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have tares? He said to them, An enemy has done this. The servants said to him, Do you want us to then to go and gather them up? But he said, No, lest while you gather up the tares, you also uproot the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. And at the time of the harvest, I will say to the reapers, first gather together the tares and bind them in bundles to burn them, but gather the wheat into my barn. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for being here with us this morning. Thank you for allowing our sound system to work the way it was designed to work. Thank you for allowing our hearts to receive your message. Thank you for opening our ears and our minds in Jesus' mighty name. So there, there's a, there's a, there's a lot of references in the New Testament to the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven. And many people say that both mean one and the same. And I believe, and I was also taught through PDG, that it does not mean the same. Um, we learned in our Light International School of Ministry that there is a difference between the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven. And, but it's very much so they're both different. The kingdom of heaven is a rule of God here on earth. And it represents any type of rulership that God might put forth on the earth at any given time. It primarily pertains to the physical kingdom of Israel. Okay, Now the kingdom of God is a more comprehensive term than the kingdom of heaven. And it embraces all created intelligence both in heaven and on earth. Who are willing, willingly subject to God and in fellowship with him. All of us who are in the church are part of this kingdom. Okay, and when I start my series on the articles of our faith, which is coming soon, we're going to talk more in depth about the differences in the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven. So if you will, in verse 24, the kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. So what is the good seed, church? What is the good seed that this man sowed? The Greek word for sow here literally means to scatter. As men and women of God were to scatter his word all over the face of this earth, amen. We're to scatter his word in the streets. We're to scatter his word in our homes and in the, in the highways and in the byways, amen. Matthew 28, 19 and 20 says, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you and you. Lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Matthew 5.14, you are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden. We are the light of the world. And what is a light created to do? A light is created to do what? To shine. John 9.5, Jesus says, I am the light of the world. John 1.1 1, 1 says, in the beginning was the word. The word was with God and the word was, was God and the word became God. And verse 14 says, the word became flesh. So if we are light... And Jesus is the light in us, and he is the word. When we let our light shine, we're letting his word shine. Amen? Am I making sense? Because the word is in us. The word is for us, and the word is around us, okay? So his word is to shine. It was never created to be hidden. If you had a cure for cancer, would you hide it? If you had a cure for addiction, would you hide it? Of course not would tell the whole world then why would you hide God's word you gotta let it shine 
Got to let it shine bright. Because God's word brings healing. God's word brings forgiveness. God's word brings restoration. God's word brings freedom. Amen? The good seed here, uh, the Greek meaning of this word, good, in the, in the verse means beautiful. And we talked about that briefly this morning. Isaiah 52, 7, how beautiful on the mountain are the feet of those who bring good news. The gospel is good news. I was reminding the men this morning that um, when Pastor Paul was in the hospital that I had the opportunity with Miss Sandy to anoint his feet with oil. And I, I made it clear that I'm not a feet person. I don't like feet. I don't touch feet. I don't like to look at them. But what an honor and a privilege it was to be able to anoint Pastor's feet with oil, and then I quoted the verse because he was such a godly man. Could you imagine how beautiful the feet are of Paul Golden when he was on the mountain sharing the gospel? And what an honor that was. I'll never forget that. It was such an honor. This word means good. It means valuable. It means virtuous. We sow goodness. Amen? Verse 24 also says that he sowed good seed in his own field. We've all been given a field in this life in which we're to scatter good seed into. The problem is we don't like the field that we're in. We don't like the field that God gave us, so we wander off into our neighbor's field. Amen? And try to sow our seed over there. And when you're sowing in somebody else's field instead of your own, guess what happens? You won't reap a harvest. Your seeds of blessing that are in your field might be tares in your neighbor's field. Does that make sense? Your seeds of blessings that you have in your field might be tares in somebody else's field. Amen. Your seeds of financial wealth in your field might be tares of destruction in somebody else's field who is addicted to gambling. Your seeds of forgiveness that you plant in your own fields might be tares in somebody else's field who has learned to manipulate because people that are forgiving hearts. Sow in your own fields. Amen. Sow in your own talents. Sow with your money. So with your gifts, and you will reap a reward. Verse 25. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. While men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. And the first thing that jumped out to me when I read that was the enemy sneaks in. He wreaks havoc on your life, and then he leaves. He sneaks in, wreaks havoc on your life, and then he leaves, leaving you to pick up the pieces. And he disappears into the night. What a coward. What a snake. What a low life. The reason he sneaks away is because he knows the power of the God who is in you, and he won't dare stand face to face with that. So he sneaks in when you're sleeping. Look, I said this before and I'll say it again because I want you to get it deep down in your spirit. While you're sleeping, your enemy is working. While you're sleeping, your enemy is working. I'm not talking about you going to bed because you're tired at night type of sleep. I'm talking about walking around with blinders on your eyes type of sleeping. I'm talking about being more like the world than Christ type of sleeping. Amen? I'm talking about engaging in your little pet sins type of sleeping. It's time to wake up, church. The enemy has come in to plunder your life. He's come in to plunder your marriage. He's come in to plunder your finances. And we don't even recognize it because we keep looking for these big things that Satan's going to bring us. But not everything he brings to you is big. David's initial downfall happened just because he was not doing what he was supposed to be doing. And on the offset, that don't look like a big sin. And it probably wasn't a big sin until one, one little thing added to another little thing. One look led to another look, led to a gaze, and next thing you know, he's committing the unthinkable. You know? Sometimes Satan hits you with a rock. He's not always going to drop a house on your head. But while you're sleeping, your enemy is working. While you're resting, your enemy is working overtime. Proverbs 6.10, a little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest. So shall poverty come on you like a prowler and need like an armed man. Look, you're not just fighting Someone who don't like you because you're smarter than them or that you have a bigger house than them. You're fighting an enemy who wants to see you suffer. Can you get that down in your spirit? Why would you engage with him? Why would you spend time with him? He wants you to suffer in every way imaginable. He wants you to be broke, busted, and disgusted. 
He wants your family to be in an uproar. He wants your children to be wayward. Listen, your enemies sow too. I think sometimes we forget that. Your enemy sows too. And he's also looking to reap a harvest. One little sin leads to another little sin. And when you get a bunch of little sins together, you have a big sin. And the next thing you know, you find that you're sowing into destruction in your life. Galatians 6, 7, and 8 says, Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. For he who sows to the flesh will of the flesh reap corruption. But he who sows to the Spirit will of the Spirit reap everlasting life. Sin separates you from God. We've learned that in our entire life. Romans 6, 23, The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So what are the tares? What are the tares that this, this parable is talking about? The word tares in this, in this uh, parable in the Greek literally means false grain. Imagine that, false grain. This is interesting to me because Satan is the false prophet who presents false promises through false doctrine. Amen? We have a lot of false doctrine going around right now. We have a lot of people in, in churches throughout this city and in this nation who's trying to put us back into bondage, put us back into the law of what the law used to be. Why would you want to go back and, and bind yourself to the law when you've got freedom in Jesus Christ? Why would you want to do that? But they've been duped. They have believed this false grain. And that not only do they believe it, but they're sharing it. And they're trying to convince other people that other, that other churches that have freedom in worship and freedom in ministry are wrong. Do y'all have freedom in Christ? Do you have freedom to worship? Do you have freedom to approach the throne boldly? Then why would we go back to people? Why would we go back to putting ourselves in bondage? I can't for the life of me understand that. How can you taste of the goodness and then turn from it? 2 Corinthians eleven fourteen 14 through 15, Paul says to the Corinthians, And no wonder, for Satan himself transforms himself into an angel of light. Therefore, it's no great thing if his ministers also transform themselves into ministers of righteousness, whose end will be according to their work. Satan has infiltrated, has, again, I, I, I learned a new word, duped, has duped so many Christians in this world, in this church, and churches around, thinking that we have to go back into bondage to have a relationship with Christ. And we don't. My relationship with Christ was paid in full. When Christ died on the cross, yes. And that veil rent in two in the temple, that was symbolic. That was symbolic for us that I no longer need a high priest to go before me and petition God for me. I no longer need a man to go and tell God that I need forgiveness. I can go to God myself. I can enter boldly into the throne room and say, look, Lord, you said this, this, and this, and I'm calling on it. Amen. Satan says, seek success at any price. God says, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Satan will get you convinced that in order to be prosperous in this life, that you have to work every single day of your life, every hour, every moment, and save all this money and not share any of it. God says, seek, his, seek him first. Satan says, seek riches at any cost. God says, do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. Amen. Matthew 6, 19 and 20. Satan says, be popular. Push ahead. God says, if anyone wishes to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Amen. Satan says, eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow you will die. God says, man does not live on bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Amen. Amen. Satan says, if it feels good, do it. And that is to me, I'm going to pause there for a minute, for a moment. That is the fastest growing religion on this planet right now is the worship of self. If it feels good to you and it's right to you, then that has to be truth. But that's not truth. Truth is not what you say it is. Truth is not what I say it is. Truth is not what our government proclaims. But truth is what God's word says. 
So if it feels good, doesn't mean it's always feeling good. And I'm going to keep it clean. Satan says, if it feels good, do it. God says, not my will, but thine be done. My point is this. Satan will take a perfect and holy marriage and present you with a false partner named Jezebel and in one act of disobedience destroy the sacred bonds of marriage. But my God says is a merciful God. He can restore that which Satan tried to destroy. Amen? Amen. Satan will take a natural desire for a man towards a woman or a woman towards a man and cause you to have false feelings, false grain towards someone of the same gender and therefore defile your entire body. But God says, faithful, he will never tempt you beyond what you can handle. Satan will take your giving heart and give you the false sense of security and tell you work is slow. Stop giving. Stop giving to people. Save all you can and can all you save. You're going to run out of money. But my God is Jehovah Jireh. He is my provider. We look for him to provide us. Not any man, not any job, not any position. God takes care of me. Amen. Philippians 4.19, Paul tells the Philippian church, And my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. King David said in Psalms 37, 25 through 26, I have been young and now I'm old, yet I have not seen the righteous forsaken. Or his descendants begging for bread. He is ever merciful and he lends and his descendants are blessed. And I'm a descendant. Although I was grafted in as a Gentile, that makes me an heir, makes me a joint heir with Jesus Christ. Whether I'm a Jew or a Gentile, I have the same rights that everybody else has. And I am blessed and I am a descendant. So what God says I can have, I can have. Amen. And he says he owns the cattle on a thousand hills. So I've been praying, Lord, we need some of them cattle to show up. We have some hungry folks. Where are they at? He says they're coming. My grace is sufficient. It's coming. Amen. It's coming. A lot of times we don't recognize the tares because they're growing with us. And I'm not going to look at all the women who just elbowed their husbands. You can't call your husband tares, okay? And it's not until harvest time that the tares are separated from the wheat. You remember last week uh, I, I talked about the threshing floor, which was leading up to the wheat and the tares. They take all the wheat and all the tares and they take it all together and they take it into the threshing floor. And they, and they, and they throw it up in the air and they have these winnowing fans. And these fans separate the wheat and the chaff and the chaff blows away. And the, and the wheat, the good grain, the, the real grain, the false grain blows out. The real grain settles down. And you have all, everything that's pure and holy. It's, it's life-sustaining grain. Amen? And so my question to you right now, hear me out, is what are you growing with today? Because in the parable, the tares grew with the wheat. So what are you growing with today? Some of you have tares in your lives that have become your best friends. Some of you have tares in your lives that are holding you back from something big. In Luke's Gospel, chapter 4, when Jesus was preaching in the synagogue, you remember that? He went into the synagogue, and he started to preach, and there was this unclean spirit. He rose up and says, Jesus of Nazareth, what have we to do with you? And Jesus cast out the demons. Now, my point in saying that wasn't that, the, that Jesus cast out the demons. My point in saying that was this spirit was already in the church, growing with the believers and nobody even recognized it until the light came in and then jesus cast it out what are you growing with this morning this demon was sitting in the synagogue and only and no not one person knew it until jesus entered the room some of y'all need jesus to enter your room to expose these tears that you're growing with amen so let me make this point and i'll move on because y'all are kind of looking at me a little sideways in this parable both the master and the servants knew the enemy planted tares among the wheat. Many of us have no idea the amount of tares we have grown with us. It's okay to expose them, church. It's okay to let other people know about them. It's okay to never be ashamed to ask for help when you know the tares that are in your life. If you're struggling with addiction, ask for help. Expose the tares that are in your life. If you're secretly depressed, ask for it. Help, expose the tears. If you're battling an eating disorder, it doesn't matter what it is. Just being able to know what they are 
gives us a better way to fight because if we know specifically, we can pray specifically. Amen? Verse 26. But when the grain had sprouted and produced a crop, then the tares also appeared. Satan has a sprout of iniquity for every sprout of grace. Amen? Satan has a sprout of iniquity for every sprout of grace in your life. When God revives his work, Satan revives his work. I learned, one of the greatest things that I learned about end time prophecy and, and revelation, uh, Pastor Paul taught me that for every generation, see we look at, uh, just kind of going off on a little side trail, we look at the Antichrist and we think it's, he's going to show up at one time. And yes he is, but what he doesn't know is when Jesus is coming back. So I learned through Pastor Paul that every generation has an Antichrist. Just in case Jesus shows up, he's already ready to go. Amen? So when God revives his work, Satan revives his work. And it's no surprise that we find scandals arising suddenly in the church to discredit the work of grace. Where God has begun to pour out his spirit. For every thing that is true and holy and perfect that God is bringing into your life, the enemy has a counterfeit. For every wonderful and beautiful godly marriage, Satan has a Jezebel. For everything that God has, Satan has a counterfeit. He said to them, verse 28, an enemy has done this. The servant said to him, do you want us then to go and gather them up? But he said, no, Lest while you gather up the tares, you also uproot the wheat with them. It's the very nature of Satan to introduce hypocrisies and wicked people into religious societies. Remember his sole reason and purpose for being alive is to still kill and destroy. It doesn't surprise me that he puts people in the church to lie, to cheat, to deceive, to trick you, to, to change God's word, to make you think it means something when it really doesn't. In order to discredit the work of God and to bring favor to his own image, that's what he wants. If he can keep havoc, if he can keep people separated, if he can keep us fighting one another instead of fighting for the kingdom, he's winning. He's winning. We have to be really careful. And I say this in love, but we have to be really careful because we can destroy the good wheat in the process of removing the tares. Pay attention to what these guys said. They said, do you want us to remove the tares? The tares represent false doctrine. The tares represent ungodly people. The tares represent un, uh, non-Christians. So you could go in and in the process of keeping the grain, the true grain, holy and separated, and you try to snatch out the, the bad grain, get rid of the, the, the bad people or, or the unbelievers... You can do damage. Are you following me? So be careful how you help people see the sin in their life. That's what I wanted to say. Be careful how you help people see the sin that's in their life because the good they have in them may not be as, as strong as the bad they have. Amen? And you can really do a lot of damage to a baby Christian when you start pointing out their sins. One thing I've learned that if I'm an alcoholic, I don't need you to come and tell me I'm an alcoholic. I know the sins that I have in my life. I need you to come and say, hey, you know what? I love you. I'm going to fight with you. We're going to fight together and we're going to get through this. You don't have to expose my sins. We have people in the church for that. Amen? We have elders. I put a lot of emphasis. I, 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 I love my elders. They are godly men. They are men of integrity. They are men of valor. They're studied up. They're prayed up. Listen, if the Holy Spirit didn't specifically tell you to point out somebody's sin, don't say it. Amen? And if he did, and if the Holy Spirit did happen to speak to you, don't say it. Not until you have got with the elders and prayed about it. Because so many people have been hurt because someone felt led to say something. I, I hate that word. I know hate. Ain't a, a proper word behind the pulpit, but I just want to tell you, I do not like the word felt led because so many things can make you felt led. I can drink some chocolate milk and feel led to do something that I don't need to be doing. Amen? 
I'm just saying. Felt led to me. Don't come up and tell me you felt led by anything because I'm going to tell you I don't know about that. Once you've offended somebody, once you have offended someone, you cannot unoffend them. Okay? So be careful. Don't be out there in the parking lot telling people, thus saith the Lord, especially to new believers. Because the, the, the good in them that they're learning to be Christians isn't as strong as the bad that's in them. And when you offend them, they're going to leave and they're not going to come back. And that defeats our entire purpose of win the lost, develop the save. Amen? What you do on your own time is between you and God. And I'm not responsible for that, but inside the body, I am. So if you really believe the Holy Spirit is speaking to you about somebody, bring it to the elders. Bring it to them. They're going to pray with you. They're going to seek God's face. And they're going to make an assessment. Yes, this needs to be said, or no, it doesn't. And then we'll move forward from that. Amen? Amen. I also want to point out, the servants of the master was ready to go and remove the tares from the wheat. They were ready to remove the unbelievers from the believers. So where was the grace? Where was the grace? Where was the hope? Where was the love? They didn't even mention that maybe, just maybe, one of these tares might, would grow into something good and, and be grafted in with the wheat. Don't be so quick to write somebody off. Give them a chance. Remember, always remember, somebody gave you a chance. When you're dealing with other people, don't look at their outward appearance. Don't look at what they're doing now. Always look on the inside of you and remember where you were when somebody helped you. Part of the vision of Light Christian Center is community. Building a community. Having a healthy body. And in order to have a community within the believers, and in order to have a healthy body, we have to look past some things. Not, not, not put up with it, but look past some things. We have to let people come in and have an opportunity to be free. Have an opportunity to grow. We can't judge them at the door and expect them to, to join us. Come on, church. And I will say, I do want to say this publicly. Y'all are doing amazing. Y'all are doing amazing. We've had a lot of new families come in, which I just happen to see. They're all out on vacation right now. So traveling, running around the world, going on Hawaii. I can't wait for them all to come back. But they have sent me messages and comments saying how welcoming they have felt. Y'all are doing amazing. And I want to thank you. Thank you so much. Because that's what makes a difference, isn't it? People don't care how much you know till they know how much you care. And when you show them that you care, no matter what they look like or, or what they sound like or what color their skin is, they come back and they get rooted and they get grounded. Amen? And I'm going to... Amen. I'm just really so far off my notes, but it's okay. It's okay. So, one thing that I've learned in my life is that when I need help, I need help. And when I come to a place or to a building, I had a friend of mine that came to this church years ago. And I'm not going to, they sat in the parking lot. They were afraid to come in because they look back at all the things that they've gone through in their life. They felt unholy. They felt unworthy. They felt ashamed. But when they walked in, our church was there with open arms. And they hugged them. They made them feel welcome. And when I'm in a bad place in my life and I'm looking for help, I'm going to a place of refuge. I'm going to a place where I know change is happening. I'm going to a place where transformation happens. I'm going to a place when they say, we welcome you, we love you, come one, come all. I'm going to walk in with all my hurts, with all my baggage, with everything I've got to carry, and I'm going to set it right at the altar. But I'm going to expect the men and women who are beckoning me to come are going to come and love me and not judge me. Amen. Amen. We have to get rid of the tears that are in our life. And that's kind of a, you may not always be able to get rid of them. The Apostle Paul was given a thorn in his flesh. And he pleaded three times with the Lord to take it from him. 
And God said, my grace is, su- is sufficient. Not all the tears that are in your life are big. Some of them are just little bitty things that irritate you. Some of them are, are, might be somebody's attitude. Some of them might be the way your kids act. Some of them might be your husband or your wife. But learn, we, 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 we're part of the world, but we're not of the world. And that's the part of the wheat that we are. We're the wholeness, we're the truth, we're the wheat of the, the good grain. And the purpose and what we're supposed to do and the reason we grow together is because we want to bring the bad grain, the false grain, into the light, into the truth. And the only way we could do that is by being true grain. You can't be real grain, you can't be truth, and you can't be light if you're not letting your light shine. You can't bring people to Christ if you're looking down at them. Amen? I'm going to close with this. Let both grow together until the harvest. And at the time of harvest, I will say to the reapers, first gather together the tares and bind them in the bundles and burn them. But gather the wheat into my barn. Though every minister of God should separate ourselves from the world unto Christ, we should judge no sinner. The man is not to be persecuted in his body or good by the men of the church because he is not sound in his faith. God tolerates him, so should we. God loves them, so should we. False doctrines are against God. He alone is the judge and punisher of the sinner. As men, we have no right to interfere in this matter. If you're not loving somebody and to being a healthy Christian, then stop. I'm going to read verse 30 again, but I want to explain it to you as I go. And I'm not a Greek scholar, but I am learning. I have a friend of mine, Robbie McGee. He's really got me focused on understanding the Greek because when you study the Greek, it really gives you a different perspective of the Scriptures. Okay? So I'm going to explain it in the Greek. So if you will, just close your eyes. Just close your eyes this morning. And, uh, and just listen closely as I read. Verse 30, let both, that's the tares and the wheat, the bad and the good, grow together side by side until the harvest. And at that time, a set time, a proper time, which this is talking about the rapture. This is when Jesus comes back and takes his people. And the dead in Christ will rise. And those that are alive and remain will be caught up in the air and forever be with Jesus. And at that time of harvest, which is a time to reap, which is a time, a, a, a special time of reaping, I will say, which is call, speak, or tell to the reapers. And one translation refers to them as the angels because they're the ones that are coming to do God's business. First, gather together which is to collect or gather up the tares. The tares are the false grain. The tares are the people that had a head knowledge of Christ but never had a heart knowledge. The tares are the people that have come to destroy everything good, holy, that God has put in your life and bind them. And that word bind in the Greek, is, it means shackles. It means bonds. They're going to be bound together. They're going to be shackled together. And bundles to burn them. And that means to burn down, to wholly consume all the bad. Everything that's come against Christ, everything that's come against Jesus is going to be bound together and consumed wholly and burned in bundles. But gather the wheat into my barn. Where the wheat? The barn is a representation of heaven where there's plenty, where there's fullness, where there's wholeness. There's coming a day when Jesus Christ will return for his people and the tares will be separated from the wheat. And the ones who call Jesus Savior will be gathered together with him in heaven forevermore. But the tares, the ones who deny him, 
who do not believe in him, who choose to live a life of pleasure, will be bound together with like-minded people and cast into the fire. And there it will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And I can stand here and tell you, church, that I've never been to hell. I've lived through some things in my life that I've called hell, but nothing like where the unbelievers are going to go. Nothing like an eternal damnation of weeping and gnashing of teeth just because you wanted pleasure on earth and you didn't want to follow Christ. And what a sad day it's going to be when we stand before Jesus Christ at the judgment seat and what we thought was holy and a perfect life because we were good people and we find out that we didn't have a relationship with him. Can you imagine the look on some people's face who think they're going to be eternal life with Jesus only to be cast into outer darkness? Don't be one of those people. I'm not saying you can lose your salvation. I'm not saying you can earn it. But what I'm saying is, what are we doing to, to, to reassure? What are we doing to promote God's kingdom? What are we doing so that we know that we have eternal life? Because it's a balance. On one hand, you got all the things of the world. That they, and, and there's so much right now, so many pleasures, so many distractions. And what used to be easy to be a Christian has now become hard because of the persecutions, because of all the extra activities that are out there. Is it hard to be a Christian? It's challenging. It's challenging to stand for truth. It's challenging to, to be set apart and sanctified and holy when you know that it's what God's called you to do and not to give in to the ways of the world. Is it worth it? Without a doubt. In the book of James, it says, Life is but a vapor. It appears for a little while and then vanishes away. The life we live here on earth is soon fading away and withering away like a flower. And one day we're going to be standing before Christ. And when we've been there for 10,000 years, this life that we lived here will be nothing but a distant memory. So how come? We can't take that little vapor of life that God has given us and live it with passion for Christ. Live it with the anointing for Christ. Unapologetically, with power and authority, can't we live for Christ? I know people who have died who refuse to believe in Jesus Christ. And it's so heart-wrenching to know where they're going to spend eternity. There ain't no, no, no waiting place. There ain't no second chances. You can't pray for the dead. What's done is done. Like we used to say in junior high, there ain't no take-backs. Your last breath here will be your first breath there. Are you really living a life for Christ? When's the last time you evaluated your walk? When's the last time you evaluated the things that you're allowing in your home, that you're allowing in your marriage, that you're allowing in your finances? Are we really living for Christ or are we playing church? I played church for so long. But I can tell you, the more I get into the Word of God, the deeper my relationship is with him and the more I want to get away from the bad things because it hurts me to sin. It hurts me to, to do things that I know ain't right. I want to be holy. And when I go up before Christ, I want him to say, Timothy, well done. Well done. You've ran the race. You've been faithful. You didn't live in the world. And you were faithful and true. And I don't want to be a coward, yellow belly, behind the scenes Christian. I want to be the guy that stands up on the pulpit, on the chair, on the mountaintops and screams, Jesus is the light. He is the way. 
and he is the truth. And those are the men and women that we need in this generation that's going down. We can't take back tomorrow. So many of us are, are, are living in this bondage that we've, of the sins that we've committed and the life that we've lived. And we're living this reckless and abandoned life. And we want to change and we don't know how to change. And we're lost. You know how to get change? Let the light change you. I can't change you. Nobody in this church can change you. It's only the blood of Jesus. We don't ever like to close our service here at Light Christian Center without giving you an opportunity to either ask Jesus to be your Savior or rededicate your life to Christ. How many of you would say that you have a life with Jesus? Amen. How many of you can look in the mirror and say, I am living to the fullest potential that Christ has set before me? Father, you know our hearts. You know the challenges we have in this world. You know the challenges we have in our life, in our home, in our circumstances. Help us to live fully for you. Help us to be more engaged with you. Help us to have a best friend relationship, Lord, a BFF with you, Father. That we can love you and trust you, Father. I pray that everything that is keeping us back from walking a truer life, from being more engaged with you, Lord, that you will expose it. Not publicly, Father. Expose it privately so we can get it out of us. Search my heart, Lord, as King David said, and see if there be any wicked way in us. And then cast it far from us, Father. Lord, we all have things that we're hanging on to that are not profitable for us as Christians, as men and women of God. I pray that you would remove that. How many of you would say that you just haven't been, you're saved, but that's about all you are? You don't have to raise your hand. Just raise your hand in your heart. You know you're saved, but you're, that's just about it. You're just saved. And you can do better. Father, help us to be engaged with you. Help us to be engaged with your word. Lord, we rededicate our lives to you for your service, for your ministry, for your calling, Father God. Help us to live a life worthy of the calling of Jesus Christ. And to, as the Apostle Paul says in the Romans, that we are not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ because it's life that is in us. And maybe you're not saved this morning. Maybe you want to experience that freedom in Christ, in Jesus. That, that there's only one way to experience that, and that's to ask Jesus to be your Savior. Is there anybody in here this morning that would like to ask Jesus to be their Savior, to change them, to mold them, to repurpose their life, and to give them newness? If that's you, just raise your hand. I'm not going to ask you to come forward. Just raise your hand. Amen. Amen. We thank you, Father, for the rededication. And we're going to pray this prayer together just in case you're just shy and you just don't want to raise your hand. But raise your hand in your heart. Pray with me. Lord Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner. And I, I need your forgiveness. I believe you died in my place and rose from the grave. So I can live in your presence forever. Jesus, come into my life. Take control of my life. Forgive me of my sins and save me. Thank you for eternal life. In Jesus' name. Can we stand and be dismissed this morning?